Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Steer Clear Podcast, a brand new part, podcast, a part of the Belly Up Sports and Belly Up Racing program. I'm your host, Dom Caps, and I'm joined today by the one and only Rattlesnake for Belly Up Sports. How's it going, Rattlesnake? What's up? Yeah, I'm happy to be here. Happy to be here for episode one. This is exciting. Yeah, I know. I've been looking to get into Belly Up Sports. You know, I've been contributing with some articles you know the past few months and i figured i wanted to take a step take the next step and i'm finally here recording a podcast you know weekly one we're gonna break down last last week's races and we're gonna preview the next races and talk about any news that happens and that's exactly how we're gonna start today we're gonna talk about the roval because we uh, we know that that was a uh, an exciting race a good race to cut off the first round uh, just before we get into it, how did you feel about the Roval Rattlesnake? Yeah, you know, I'm a little indifferent. Uh, I, I understand the hatred for the Roval. I understand people loving the Roval. It was an entertaining race. It's just, at the end of the day, I'm like, do stock cars like belong in this kind of race? You know what I mean? Yeah, It's no, just it's an d- awkward situation. It's definitely different than all the other road courses, like, I feel like it's just its own entity. I almost can't even call it a road course because it's right. just so different. And, you know, you got Watkins Glen, Sonoma on the schedule. The fans have been wanting that road course element to be added to the playoffs. I'm not sure if this was the right way to handle it. But it definitely brings out a good crowd. It's good for the track. I guess they needed something different. I mean, I've been to the last two Coke 600s, and the Coke 600 is just a great race. I'm, I've never been to the Bank America 500 in the fall, so I don't know if it was you know lackluster fan-wise and they needed to change something up or if it was the only track that offered to make itself a road course in the playoffs. I'm not too sure how that all went down. But if they're just like, hey, we need one more race at Charlotte since we already don't have enough. Yeah, I, <laughs> it's definitely interesting, but it it brings out, you know, basically the almost like the human element in drivers. You think these drivers can't wreck by themselves and you're seeing drivers go off the racetrack here all weekend. And even during the race, they still don't got this track figured out. And that's just what makes it so different because you don't see drivers just going off, spinning out at Sonoma or Watkins Glen. Yeah, and I'm still not sure how I feel about even, like, I understand fans want more road courses. uh, They just want more diversity. But at the end of the day, are road courses, like, do they produce better racing? Like, honestly, I I mean, I don't know if they do. I, I think the best racing we see are, you know, short tracks. Yeah, if anything, I, that'd be my vote. I'd say, you know, hey, there's that little short track behind the track. You know, you always see it in the helicopter view. Right. You know, get them out there. And, you know, Martinsville's always one of the best playoff races when right. it comes down to the end. So, you know. Yeah, Bristol. Think, yeah, you, you always enjoy these short tracks. So, at the end of the day, I'm like, should NASCAR completely just go back to their roots and just say, screw it? You know, we made a mistake. <laughs> Let's go yeah. back to the South. Let's go back to short tracks, maybe the Midwest, you know, where people really appreciate us. And if I'm not mistaken, isn't Bristol going to be in the playoffs as well next year? Because I believe they added Bristol to the playoffs. That's I'm a good not, question. Yeah, I'd have to double check. I'm not 100% sure I'm going to check that now. But if it is, then you got those, you're going to have two races that are short tracks next year which would be more interesting to me i think it's yeah no next year we've got the first round itself is darlington darlington Uh, richmond and bristol yeah i like it now talk about a first round that is a great first round definitely more interesting than what we've got now you know, I think even, like, the next round isn't too bad. The Roval got moved back even further. I'm not sh- – I'm not – I'm not too certain how I feel on that. 
yeah, it's just it's just an awkward race to watch for stock cars, you know. Like <laughs> they're just it's almost like they don't belong there. Um, and you know, I, obviously. The outcome was. How do you feel about Chase Elliott? Let me ask you first and foremost. So, Ch- my opinion on Chase Elliott himself, I'm, I, I'm not the biggest fan of Chase Elliott. I that's got to be. I'm gonna put that out there. I'm not the biggest fan of Chase Elliott. I don't root for him. It might. It could be some of you know. I was a Jeff Gordon fan, so it could be some of that. You know, I didn't like him going into the 24 car originally. But I, I'm not too big on him. I don't like his like personality. I think he's kind of bland, if you get what I'm saying. Just not much from him that I kind of like. Okay, so who do you like then? I mean, right now, I kind of moved over to the Gibbs side. I, I do like Denny Hamlin. He's my number one right now. And then I've liked, because I've watched Eric Jones since the beginning. So he's a driver I really like. And same with Christopher Bell when he gets up to the Cup Series next year. Oh, yeah. Those are guys I'm going to root for because they earned their way up to the Cup Series. Eric Jones got his start by beating Kyle Busch at the Snowball Derby. That takes a lot of skill to beat Kyle Busch and for him to have the respect to hire you to drive one of his trucks and then to work your way up through the system where there's not many very rides. There's not, not that many rides up in the Cup Series now. Yeah, and to earn your way up there, I think it proves something. Yeah, I mean he's definitely a talented driver. Um, I don't really, honestly, I don't have problems with any drivers anymore. I, I'm still not a Kevin Harvick fan. I don't think I ever will be. I don't think I'll ever like him. But other than Harvick, I just I don't really have any issues. I don't have any issues with Joey Logano anymore. I don't have issues with Kyle Busch anymore. Like, the Kyle Busch stuff just makes me laugh more than anything. Um, I think, and Joey I think, Logano hasn't done anything douchey in how long? Like, I, I just I kind of forgot about it. Yeah, Kyle Busch brings an element to this sport that it needs more of. I feel like more of these drivers are lacking the personality, and we need more personality in this sport. We really do. And that's what Kyle Busch is bringing. He's – I don't know – like, people, the fans are like, oh, people are too boring. And then Kyle Busch says something, and they're like, oh, he's just a crybaby. <laughs> so the fans, that's one thing. The fans are very, very hypocritical, I'm going to say. They want one thing, and when it does happen, they don't want it anymore. So it's, I don't know. I Kyle Busch, in my opinion, is the best driver on the racetrack right now. I think if you put all the cars equal, Kyle Busch should get the most out of it. I think yeah. he's got the best driving style in the field. I mean, I know it's episode one for you, so you probably don't want to piss off any fans that you're trying to get. But in my podcast, I said NASCAR has the worst fans of any sport I've ever encountered. Oh, it's definitely up there. I it's... mean, it's terrible. It's awful. Like, NASCAR fans are the worst. They'll just find anything to complain about. You know, yep. they'll they'll be they'll completely contradict themselves just because they I don't know if they're just like cynical and jaded or uh, I'm kind of that way. So I guess maybe that's a thing. <laughs> I, I don't know. I also think Twitter doesn't help because people just rant on Twitter and it's like that's not really what most people think. Um, but speaking of fans, you know, wanting one thing and then f- reacting a different way, I know you did want to eventually get into it. Uh, but whenever you're ready, I'd love to talk about Bubba. Oh, well, we can get into that right now, honestly. You know, you look at Bubba Wallace. You know, he's he's out there. He's giving Alex Bowman the bird. What was and that it, about? Did you ever find out more about that? I, I believe it all stemmed from the lap one incident where Bowman went into the bus stop too hot, lost control of his car, and hit Bubba. I know that's what happened on the first lap going okay. to the bus stop. Yeah. So I think he wasn't too pleased after that. And then basically for a whole lap, he was given the bird. Bowman <laughs> said, if he keeps doing it, I'm taking him out. And he took him out at the uh, exit of the bus stop. Bubba wasn't too happy. And this is, see, I was fine with everything up until 
I was even fine with Bubba coming over and throwing the Powerade at him. I was fine with that until he. I found I, he made a comment where he said but Bowman was faking being sick just to avoid getting punched in the mouth. <laughs> See now, see that, yeah, I that's, heard that. that's where you, that's where you push it a little too far. I I think I'm all for boys have at it. I'm all for that. I'm all for the fights. But to say something like that is kind of iffy. He, he said something else. It was back in the 2017 500, I believe, where he he like called out Hamlin because he ended up door slamming Hamlin. And cutting his right front tire, which made Hamlin put him in the wall. Are you talking about when he third. was like, he needs some Adderall? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> see, see, I, and I think Bubba is, he's talking way over that his was head. Bubba, I feel that like, was Bubba's rookie first ever race. That's when he got second at the Daytona 500. Yeah. And I feel like Bubba's just over his head. I think he's got to realize where his spot is on the track right now. He's not running inside of the top 20. So I, and he can't be messing with these championship contenders like that. I just to say that like all the drivers were on the ground after the race. I'm pretty sure Bowman wasn't just trying to avoid you. Like I think right. that was the least of his concerns when he got out of the car because I think they even showed that the front end of the field didn't get water during that red flag. Oh damn! They actually, they actually only got the back end of the field water. So the front end, and he was dying. He was begging for water, and they rolled the cars off before he could get, before he can get any water. So it's it's just, I don't know. I think there's a line, and Bubba crossed that line, in my opinion. Well, I mean, speaking of Kyle Busch, uh, I thought it was hilarious that he just pulled in and just said, "Fuck it, I'm done." For <laughs> yeah, that was hilarious when he just said, "Fuck it, I'm done." That's the kind yeah. of Kyle Busch that I actually like. I'm like, dude, that's hilarious. You had no chance at winning. You were tired. You were hot. Like whatever, I'm done. Um, Broken but... sway bar. And you, see, and we're gonna go back to the fans here. These fans posting memes of you know, Ch- oh Chase Elliott crashed and then came back and won and didn't cry. Well, Kyle Busch cries and parks it with seven to go. I don't think he cried like, at all. He just said, he just logically, he was like, it, fuck this. Like, I have no chance. He said, I'm done. Like I'm done. We're sitting here on, on red, and I'm dying in here. For what? Like, okay, yeah, if you're, you know, Chase Elliott, you, you know, if you're in the top, if you're even on the final lap, right? If you're on the lead lap, you're like, yeah, I got something to wait here for. But he was thinking, what, why am I sitting here, like, he, suffering? This is stupid. Was, he was three laps down, damaged car. Car was there was awful, no broken sway way. bar. There was no way he was ever going to come back from that. And he and, just thought about it and said, but I would do the same thing. And, it, like, and it, if anything, that? if anything, he got Eminem's more exposure by doing that. Because I if he know. just sits there and rides Jeez. for the last seven laps, they're not showing Kyle Busch once. And the funniest thing is, uh, I, I wanted to tweet this. I don't know if I uh, ended up tweeting. It was going to be something along the lines of like, uh, Post race interview, all the reporters wait for Kyle Busch to say something, and then everybody on Twitter freaks out about it, and they're like, "Oh, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> Kyle Busch, you know," and they're just making fun of him, and and then after a race one, he has nothing to say. They go, "Wait, where's Kyle Busch? How come he's not saying anything?" And no. so that that's the fans we're dealing with here. But to get back to Bubba, um, I guess my my whole thing was like. He, I, I, I didn't have a problem. I, I'm with you. I didn't have a problem with any of it. You know, um, really it comes down to people had a problem with Bubba throwing water or Gatorade or whatever it was on him while he was on the ground. Um, if anything, Jeff Gordon got hit by that. Like, yeah, if I'm, anything, I'm, I'm upset Jeff Gordon got collected. You know, I was going to say, if anything, be more upset that Jeff Gordon got involved in that because even he was like whoa like how the hell did i, I get mean, involved? i mean uh, poor guy poor guy i mean jeff gordon sitting there in a nice polo and it's just right. soaked like <laughs> yeah and he's like whoa I, so you know everyone's like he's getting medical attention it's like he's just a little dehydrated and overheated like let's calm down he doesn't have cancer or anything yeah uh, you know they're just trying to get some fluids in him so yeah, exactly. a little bit of a little bit of fluid on his face is not gonna hurt him 
um, everybody calm down, right? And he intent he he did uh, intentionally wreck Bubba. Let's not forget that. Like he, he had something coming back to him. I don't care if he's sitting on the ground. Like something had to come back to him. So um, I I think he got off real easy, honestly, for what he did. Um, it's but honestly, it's honestly crazy how many times water gets involved in these fights. I mean, look. <laughs> I mean, back in 2013, what are they gonna learn? Club Joey, Joey Logano throwing water right. bottles at Tony yep. Stewart. Yep, exactly. Uh, and it did not stop Big Tony Stewart. But um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I just, I, I, I read those comments after the fact, like you said, how he was like he he was faking it to not get punched. Uh, obviously, that does not look good, and. I'm not like a Bubba fan, by the way. Like I could care less about e- honestly either of these drivers. So this is a completely unbiased opinion. I think Bubba w- wanted an altercation because he was angry. Obviously, he was hot. Mm-hmm. He got re- intentionally wrecked. He he wanted some kind of altercation, and when he didn't get it, I think he was still angry and just kind of lashed out and was like, "Yeah, it's kind of like what you would say. You're like, yeah, I bet he's on the ground faking it so I don't punch him. You know, like." Like it's like what you would say to your friends if you wanted to fight some guy at a bar or something, you know? Like it, yeah. it just seems like that. Like he's gonna look back and be like, "Yeah, like that wasn't the smartest thing to say to the media." And it's I, crazy. I think he was just upset. You don't see Bubba Wallace in the headlines anymore unless it's for getting involved in wrecks or incidents right. with these guys. I mean, you went see at Watkins Glen. He took out Kyle Busch after some contact. Uh, yeah, I mean, he's just. I don't know. He's got to, he's got to step it up. I'm not sure how much longer he's gotten at 43 if he doesn't step the performance up. I mean, the thing is, like, I don't know who else is gonna. I'm not saying he. There's not better drivers than him out there that could use the ride 100. percent Like, I think but, Daniel Hemrick is better. I think Daniel Hemrick is more suited suitable for him. I you look Bubba Wallace every time he's been in a ride. He he's got even at teams with teammates. He's gotten outperformed by his teammates. Yeah, but I mean, what's Daniel Hemrick going to do in the 43 that he couldn't do in the 8, you know? And like, I'm not sure what's wrong with RCR. There's I, a lot wrong with RCR, it's, but it's, I don't think – what my point is, like, if anything, I would keep Bubba if I'm the 43 just because the guy can at least bring in the media and the publicity. I know they're talking about how they're having problems getting sponsorship, but I think that's – honestly, I think that falls on Richard Petty because – what other guy can be out there and get as much media attention without ever performing than Bubba Wallace? Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, I, I, Daniel Hemrick's not going to get you right. that media attention. He's just not. I like Daniel Hemrick a lot, and I wanted him to stay with RCR and try to succeed. But when it comes to a personality and getting media attention, like he's not the guy that's going to do it. Yeah, no, I agree. It definitely comes down to... A lot of it, if you do have a personality, even the smallest personality these days, you're you're way ahead because a lot of these drivers, like I'm, I'm not, I, I like William Byron, right? I, I I like him, but he's very plain. He just doesn't have any personality. Yeah, very plain. And I'll say this too about Chase Elliott because he is a soft-spoken guy, but. I think Chase Elliott has actually done well and played into that, where people know him as just the cute, quiet guy. You know, it's almost like you're forming a boy band, and you need the bad boy. You need the, you know, Chase yeah, yeah. Elliott is the good, mm-hmm. quiet boy. Uh, <laughs> and he plays it well, um, and he has the name and stuff. So even that kind of personality can work if you play it your cards right. You don't have to be outspoken and talk shit and want to fight you can be a different personality um we'll see i think eric jones could be a good one like that as well where i think get himself out there and a little bit more uh brand awareness and without having to talk a lot you know what i mean yeah i think eric jones is if he could just get that i think he just needs some luck because i feel like he he has the worst luck in the cup series i feel like when it comes to anything, I mean, he can run fine and just get wrecked. I mean, yeah, he and he gets a fourth place finish. He's looking good. He rebounds after the first week in the playoff, and he fails inspection when he's the lowest finishing Gibbs driver. And 
you know, he comes into the roval, he gets up towards the front, gets wrecked, taps the outside wall, and it happens to put a Right. Oh, and it's radiator. While Chase Elliott goes head on into the wall, and it does basically nothing <laughs> to the car. It may have even. And he ends up he ends up doing a burnout after a victory in the same spot. Yeah, I. For he, the sake for the sake of NASCAR too, I think we need Chase Elliott's obviously performing, um, which is great. But next we need Eric Jones and Ryan Blaney to start performing. Yeah. Uh, because they're two good personalities and they're young that could keep the sport, you know, thriving. Uh, and, you know, whatever your feelings are about each driver, I just think those are the next two that need to perform and step up like Chase has. Uh, Eric is and Blaney, you get like hints of it and then you forget about him. Yeah, Ryan Blaney, I, I've, I'm going to talk about him later in a segment we're going to do okay. later. But I do have him slated in the uh, toward the end of the podcast. Okay, so overall, Roval, um, I mean, what did you think? It was an all right race. Yep. <laughs> you, see, you see these drivers that come out, you know, the only three or four guys that were in it all day were Chase Elliott, Martin Truex, and Kevin Harvick. Other than that, it was just more or less comers and goers, strategies played, who was toward the front. And then you just see this whole mess of Ryan Newman getting caught up in a wreck pitting, getting caught up in another wreck pitting, caught up in another wreck pitting. Um, we're all waiting too long to pit, which cost him. And then Bowman driving from six to second on the fresh tires. It, the ending was kind of crazy just because people were just throwing their cars in everybody else toward the end. Right. But I feel like I, I don't know how I feel about it. And then next year it's going to be probably even more crazy at the end because it's going to be the round of 12 cutoff for the round of eight. So it's a good – it's not a bad track. It's just not a great track. I'm, I think they could have done, definitely done something better. I think a short track – like next year, the first round's phenomenal. I uh, got to applaud NASCAR for that. I mean, you got three base dry, tracks that drive like short tracks almost, even though Darlington is a mile and a half. But it's one of the better mile and a halves, you know, when it comes to the racing aspect. Right. So, and the attendance, man. If you haven't been to Darlington, that's a track you got to go to. Yeah, no. Once I get, once I graduate from college, I'm definitely gonna. Oh man, be making my way out there. One of my favorite races to go to. I still got to get there in Daytona 500. I know I'm probably gonna do that one in a couple of years when oh, I get yeah. out. So yeah, that's some stuff I got to do. And speaking of stuff we got to talk about, you know, we were talking about Daniel Hemrick and that eight car. He's out. Tyler He's Reddick out. coming in next year. Xfinity Series champion last year. He's going to go in. He's in the hunt again this year for the championship. Uh, how are you feeling about Tyler Reddick? Well, first of, all, first of all, do you think he's going to win the championship in the Xfinity this year? No, I don't think he repeats. I think Christopher Bell is too determined this year. Yeah. I think he's too determined to let it go this year. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. I, I, I tend to agree with you on that one, but I just I, I never count Reddick out. Um, in that poll... I know Billy Up Racing did, uh, you know, will Reddick put RCR back in the playoffs? And my thought with that is Reddick is a great driver. I, I put yes, by the way, on the on the poll. But to explain it, yeah. uh, Reddick is a great driver, and I think Reddick could be a future star. Um, he also has, like we were saying, the personality to get sponsorship and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, you know, so he's gonna, I mean, RCR needed him badly. I didn't know they were going to get rid of Hem Hemrick. I thought they were maybe going to bring back the 31 full time or the 29, you know, something bring back a third car. I think finances had something to do with them having to let Hemrick go and not have a three, uh, charter team. But I, I, like, I, I don't know if Reddit can get RCR back in, uh, uh in the playoffs because I think, Austin Dillon is a good enough driver to be in the playoffs, and he can't. So I think it comes down to the equipment. I think it comes down to what's RCR going to do going into 2020 to make sure both their drivers can get in the playoffs because I think Reddick, like I said, is a great driver, a future star. We'll see how he performs. Um, we've seen him perform in the Cup Series, and he's done really well. Uh, we'll see how that 
unfolds for a full season. But like I said, I, I mean, I think Austin Dillon is at least, a, you know, a playoff driver. Um, and if he can't make it, then I don't know what that says about any other driver that's going to go into one of those cars. Yeah, I mean, you look at Tyler Reddick. He's run two cup races so far. One, obviously, the Daytona 500. Can't look too much into that. He got caught up in a crash in lap 191. And then you got to look at Kansas, where he finished yep. ninth. He finished the ninth beast. at Kansas. And you got to look at that as a, you know. Yeah, that's huge. Of, you got to look at that as, you know, he might have it. I mean, that's one start, obviously. It's not a whole it's season. top 10, though, in the Cup Series. It's a top 10 in the Cup Series. In an intermediate series. track. I mean, that's, you know. Yeah, which is basically half the schedule. So you right. gotta look, you gotta look at that as something positive going in the next year. And if he can win another championship this year in the Xfinity series, that just gives me even more confidence in the next year. Even though I'm I'm still not convinced he deserved that championship at all last year. <laughs> let it let it be said here, I'm not the biggest Tyler I am not a Tyler Reddick fan at all. Okay. But I mean I do respect his driving. I'm just not a fan of him. RCR and, does a good job of getting drivers that people don't seem to like. Like, yeah, I'm not a fan of the Dillon brothers. I was pretty disappointed to see Austin Dillon win his first career race at the Coke 600. I'll let that be said. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, with Tyler Reddick, I think I think he'll do some good stuff. I think he'll be in the playoff battle. I think I don't think he'll be, like, out of it. I don't think he'll be, like, Austin Dillon and Daniel Hemrick this year where he's, like, 23rd. Come into the stretch, but I think he'll be around that, you know, 16th to 20th area. I think he, he even he might have a shot to win a couple races. You never know. And another driver, you know, switching or moving up is Christopher Bell. Christopher Bell, I I I'm saying it right now. Christopher Bell is going to win at least one race next year in the Cup Series. I'm not afraid to say that. You think so? Yeah, I think. What they've done with that 95 team, I think it's just only going to get better with having Bell there, especially the help Joe Gibbs is going to give them. They might give them, you know, this year's chassis, you know, bodies instead of, you know, last year's setups they're given to Matt Benedetto on that 95 team. It's almost, I feel like it's just going to be a fifth Gibbs car, essentially, next year. I think they're going to... And if anything, since Eric Jones only signed that one-year contract, it could be a decider to see who does better to earn that 20 car the year after. And I just think Christopher Bell's got the raw talent to go out there and win a race, whether it's at Bristol or Dover. He's really good there. He's good at these mile and a half. You know, he's good at Richmond. I think, he, there, I think within the next year or two, he'll be in – that Gibbs team as one of the four. It's just so hard to keep him out. So you think we're going to see the 95 in victory lane? Yeah, 95 will be a victory lane next year. I don't see it, man. I think he's a great driver, and I think he'll do good with the equipment he has, but I do not see that happening. Because I think he is miles ahead of better of a better driver than Matt Benedetto. I'm, I'm going to say that. I yeah, think... I agree with you there, but... I just think the equipment's going to limit him at some point. And, I, I mean, I, I was just talking about how the equipment that Reddick's about to walk into is bad. I think 95's even worse off than the 8. I, it's just, I think they're going to do, they're definitely going to put more resources into that car, I feel like, just because they know Christopher Bell is going to be with the Gibbs team. Like, I'm pretty, like, they did the alliance for Matt Benedetto, but I feel, because they, they even said he was running 2018 cars, basically, as compared to the 2019 setups. And what Matt Benedetto has done has been fantastic. I'm not going to say anything bad about Matt Benedetto. He's done a great job in that car. Yeah. But I just think Christopher Bell could take it to that next level and put that car in victory lane next year. And I think it'll come at Dover or Richmond. If I had to pick a track, it'd be one of those two. Okay. All right. We'll see. Um, I'm not as confident as you are. but <laughs> And, you know, something I'm not too confident about, but no, no one knows too much about it yet, is the next-gen car. 
How, <laughs> how, we, how, how are you feeling about that? That is set to debut in 2021. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, did you see my article that I wrote for Belly Up Sports on that before they before they even? Yes, announced I did. It, yes, which I is did. Kind of funny. It came out really before, right? Like that a couple days before that announcement. So that was kind of funny how that worked out. I yeah. was just like, it seems about that time when NASCAR is gonna make some announcement. So I I wrote it obviously as a joke. Um, <laughs> I feel like some people thought it was serious. Yeah, <laughs> I was like, come on, did you read it? Like, <laughs> I said, you know, um, uh, I I don't know. What are your thoughts? Well, I think I actually saw this YouTube video yesterday talking about how the next gen car could really determine the fate of the Na- of NASCAR as a result of the fans. Because I I watched that video and he described he he explained it. He said NASCAR really reached its peak in about 2007, and then once they introduced that car of tomorrow, the viewing kind of went down. And then they peaked back up in 2011. And then once the Gen 6 car came out, er- the ratings just seemed to drop. Just like took a nosedive. And it's been kind of stabling it out the last couple of years just with the uh, impact, like the uh, action during the playoffs. And now oh, NASCAR has a chance to either lose more fans with how this car performs, or it has a chance to gain some of those fans back to get NASCAR back to where you know, obviously not back to where it was in the mid 2000s because that was peak NASCAR I feel like that was when you were getting all these sellouts the crowd was always full I think it comes down to the cars got they got to hit this car right they can't mess up with this car this car's got to perform it's got to look good because NASCAR can't afford to keep taking those dives when it comes to the fan base yeah, the, I will say the only I, uh, previously I've been very cynical about NASCAR and the decisions that they make. It seems like lately, especially this season, they've been trying to to actually listen to the fans and you know really give fans what they want more than I've seen in the past you know years. Um, so that's good. That's a little reassuring. You know, they talk about wanting to go back to the roots and like that's that's good. These are all good things. So I'm hoping the next gen car is a little bit more towards what fans want to see. N- not even that, because fans are gonna complain about anything. Like they could literally release the most ideal package possible to you. Yeah. And a thousand people on Twitter would say this is stupid, I'm never watching again. Yeah. So Look, whatever they do, as long as the performance on the track is good, then I'm happy. I could care less about what everybody on Twitter thinks. Um, I would just, I would like to see them finally try to go back to actual stock car racing, because I've become more of a fan of like, you know, late and super late model dirt tracks because you feel like you're really watching stock car racing. And obviously yeah. they're not going to go back to like local dirt tracks, <laughs> but you know, you, there's just a different feeling and it, and it feels NASCAR has felt really artificial for a long time. So and it, you're, it's really put in the hands of basically the teams and the cars back, you know, even in the mid two thousands, a lot of it was driver. A lot right. of it, it wasn't, you know, you got the lead, you're guaranteed, you know, the clean air is just too good for you. It was, you know, you had to move, you had to switch lanes. There wasn't these stupid stage cautions. I mean, you know, the, like, oh, man, don't even get me started with the officiating in last week's race. The, some of these cautions did not need to be thrown. Uh, it was ridiculous. And you just, I think it's going to, I think I have a little bit of confidence just because it's not Brian France anymore. It's right. Jim France. He seems to be caring. He seems to be listening to the drivers, the teams, and the fans. He's talking to them, which is good. And he's being more proactive. You know, Brian France. You would never see him talking with anybody. No, no he wouldn't even. He wouldn't even talk to the person that won an award. You know, he yeah. Would, he'd walk off stage before uh, shaking your hand. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. That's what it comes down to, really. Um, it's just he seems to be doing a, a slightly better job of trying to 
stabilize what was left. And yeah, I think if they just try to go back to quality racing and also just they need to try to figure out a way to make it a little more affordable so smaller yeah. teams can compete because like you said a lot of it has to do with like the teams and the, and the equipment they're in and that's a problem but if that's a problem you can't solve immediately then maybe make it more affordable to where like, these small teams can compete as well like they've got to get they got to get rid of the charter system they got to get rid of it it's just too much money on these smaller teams I mean, how much money it costs to actually get a charter, it's ridiculous. I think they sh- that's why we're seeing, like, 36-car fields now. You know, like, 10 years ago, f- when there was 43 cars, you'd have three or four guys going home every week because there were too many drivers. Now you can't even get a 40-car field. Yeah, yeah, nobody can afford it. Yeah, the, the only tracks you'll have a chance at seeing it is the restrictor plates because the teams know as long as they're in a draft, they'll be okay. That's literally it. So it's just, they got to cut these costs. I saw something about them cutting pit stops in the Xfinity and Truck Series. Yeah. See, now that's yeah. where it gets yeah. too much. You need pit stops. That's just a part of racing. Right. If that, we don't, that's if, absurd. If we don't put pit stops... The guy that starts in the back has no shot. Right. Yeah, you need to have some pit strategy. Like, that's that's racing. <laughs> that, that, that literally hands the win to the fastest car. If you have the fast car, you're going to win. That's it. Because you won't lose the lead because you don't have to pit. Right. right. So, it's, you know, enough of the future. Well, not enough of the future. Enough of the far future. Let's get into... A segment I like to call the Steer Clear segment here at the Steer Clear podcast. We got the playoff drivers to steer clear from this weekend at Dover. I've got two drivers, and that's Clint Boyer and Ryan Blaney. I, I Clint Boyer, Dover's not been his best track. He's been he struggled there almighty last fall. He actually, I think he caused the caution before where all hell broke loose on the second to last restart, where Al Marola hit the wall and hit Brad Kozlowski, and the big one ensued. I was actually at that race. It was interesting. I went with the Brad Kozlowski fan. He was not too happy when Al Marola <laughs> hit the wall. But um, I think he's been kind of irrelevant. If I, if I had to put a word for Clint Boyer, he's been kind of irrelevant on the racetrack. He sneaks into this round, and Dover's not a good track for him. I think trouble could be looming for him. And Ryan Blaney, he has been off the radar here for a while, and Dover is not one of his best racetracks either. So it just doesn't add up for me for them to have a great run, and I think they're going to be behind the eight ball going into Talladega. Okay. Well, um... I got I to gotta try to think of, like, other people just to mix it up, to steer clear of, right? Because if I just pick yours, that's boring. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I guess Kyle Larson, he's still in it, right? Yeah, he did struggle there last fall, too. He actually... See, there you go. Then Kyle he... Larson. Like, the fact that I'm even, like, Kyle Larson's still in it, right? Yeah. Yeah, you no. know, Kyle Larson's been kind of quiet this year. He hasn't won in forever. <laughs> Seriously. I think there's kids now watching NASCAR saying, who's that, Dad? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's gotten bad. And then, um, just to piss people off, I'm going to say Bowman. <laughs> yeah, just Bowman, cause... He I think he ran towards the front in the spring, but I mean, they. I don't think he has that same speed he had back in the spring when he went on that run of like second place finishes before winning at Chicago. Well, and I just think it would be funny after uh, the incidents last weekend. Oh, yeah. No, it, I think – and I think favorites going into this week, you got to look at Kyle Busch, Martin Truex. I think Truex is going to win personally. I think Truex wins Sunday. I think Harvick's going to be up there. He's always strong at Dover. The one person I'm kind of iffy on is Denny Hamlin because I think Dover statistically is his worst track. But if he's going to run well there, it's going to be this year just because of how good he's been all year. He did he did finish second last year after being eliminated. So anything can happen at Dover. We 
And Chase Elliott's good there. A lot of drivers are really good at Dover, actually. I mean, Kislowski's not bad. I think Logano's yeah, Kislowski's that Kislowski's that sleeper that you kind of forget about, and then you're like, oh wait, you know, he'll end up in like the round of four, and you're like, how the hell? <laughs> and I, I don't even think I can even I can't even predict who's going to get eliminated this round until after Dega. You can't predict Dega. Just right. doesn't matter who it is. I mean. You're bound to get caught up in the big wreck at some point. I mean, even a driver that's on a roll at these restrictor plates, one little, you know, slip up by, you know, Ricky Stenhouse, and everyone's, you know, dead. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, so I, I'm i not sure. I'm not going to predict anything until after I see Talladega. Then everything will be more, more clear because we go to Kansas, which should be more tame to end the round. Definitely was last year. Yep, I was at that race. I'm still thinking about going back. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of up in the air. I don't, I don't think I'm going to be able to make Dega. So uh, definitely going to go to Texas. Uh, maybe Kansas also. We'll see. Yeah, some tracks I'll have to get out there. You know, at some point in my life. I mean, eh, you're not missing every much. Track. Yeah, you're not missing much out here. Uh, but yeah, man. Thanks for having me on. This has been a great yeah, first no, episode. No, definitely. I'll be back next week with episode two. We'll be talking about Talladega. Or not Talladega. We will be talking about Talladega, but we'll be talking yeah. about we we'll talking about Dover. Anything that happens in between now and next week. I'm sure so, there'll be more drama. Oh, yeah. So I thank you all for listening. Go check out Belly Up Sports, Belly Up Racing on Twitter. Uh, check us out, and I'll see you guys next week.